<laughs> Music. It's part of all of our lives. How did that make you feel? Maybe take you back to childhood, remind you of a memory you hadn't thought of in a while? Maybe made you want to get up out of your chair and gallop around the stage, right? So have you ever thought to think, why? Why does music do all these things for us? And in particular, what's going on in our brain when we make or listen to music? Well, it turns out a lot is going on in our brains. This picture here is a brain scan of a musician, a pianist, improvising. It's from the work of Charles Lim. And the red and blue show areas of activation and deactivation during this musical performance. What I want you to see is just how much of the brain is touched by music. Because of this, scientists like myself really feel that we can use music as a great tool to help us understand the brain, but also to change it. Many people have wondered, well, does music do good things for the brain? Is it good exercise for the brain, particularly for kids? Well, there's a lot of research, growing research, showing that music can improve math skills, reading, even school attendance, confidence, as was talked about earlier today. But there's still a question. Well, what is, actually, what is music changing in the brain that enables those improvements to happen? Today, I'd like to talk to you about a study, the symphony study, that's asked, trying to answer that question. But before that, in the 2020 vision of looking ahead to the future, I'd like to sketch out a vision of education, informed by brain, what we know about the brain, to help people meet their greatest, greatest potential. So consider what that would be like. Imagine Jeannie, a five-year-old, going to the doctor for her annual checkup. Okay, like all of us, she'll have her height and weight measured. And the doctor will show her and her parents where she falls on growth charts of height and weight. We've all seen these. In fact, the World Health Organization publishes worldwide growth charts that are used as standards to help us plan nutrition, both for individuals and society. But what about kids' minds and brains? Where's a growth chart for that? What if in 2020, the doctor could measure Jeannie's brain? And what if we had growth charts of the brain so that he could plot out the growth of different functions in different areas of her brain? Maybe some things are ahead of the curve, but circuit X or area Y, maybe that's a little bit behind. What would we do with that knowledge? Well, what if we also knew that something like music could actually impact different brain areas because of its all-encompassing nature and might specifically help brain areas develop? Well, we could use that knowledge then to perhaps suggest that Jeannie take up violin in an orchestra or sing in a choir. How are we going to get to that point? We're still a long way, but it's an exciting time in science right now where we have brain imaging and we're starting to sketch out the developmental path of the brain. For example, this work here is from a group here in San Diego led by Terry Jernigan. The PING project measured the brains of over 1,000 people across the country from age 2 to 22 and sketches out these curves of area and thickness of the cortex, the outer wrinkled part of our brains. And these black lines show kind of the average growth, the average trajectory of growth of these things in people. But each dot on that graph is a person, an individual, and we really care about what's happening to their brains. What happens to them next year, the year after? Take the thickness chart. It decreases, it's an apparent measure, and it decreases, and it's a good thing in kids because that actually reflects greater growth of connections into the cortex. What about someone up here who has relatively immature cortical thickness? What will happen to them next? Will they just follow the same path that they're on and remain sort of behind the curve for their age? Or will they catch up? converge down to the mean? And what impact would that have on this child's growing set of skills? And is there anything we can do to change this, to make one scenario turn into the other? Well, this leads us to the big questions. 
how is each of our individuality, the constellation of skills, talents, likes, dislikes, how does that depend on our brain, the exact developmental path that our brain has taken versus someone else's? And in particular, what can we do in our experience to shape the development of the brain? So, you know, little questions like that. These questions will take many years, maybe even lifetimes, to answer, because they really are the question of the seed of individuality. But we're starting to make progress on them. A, another study at UCSD by the same group, Pling, the longitudinal cousin of Ping, has started to look at um, brain growth over a period of five years in a group of 200 kids starting age five to 10. And that's where I come in. I had the great fortune to be able to piggyback a study on this Pling study, a study of music, where we asked the question, what does music experience do for growth of the brain? This will enable us to answer questions like, well, does music really target specific areas or circuits of the brain? And if so, how does that link up to increased abilities in other domains? So that's the symphony study. And it's not misspelled. We partnered with the San Diego Youth Symphony, their community opus program. Deluke Smith spoke about that earlier. Um, if you weren't here, it's a fantastic youth program of intensive orchestral training. So many of our music kids come from that program. Now, in the scientific you know, kind of universe these days, multi-million studies of five years of brain growth for music, it's not quite on the national radar yet of NIH. Um, but I, there are some you know, forward-looking foundations that enabled this project to get started. Um, and in particular, I'd encourage you to look up UC Merci, which is a new uh, UC President's Office-funded initiative across the state to improve music cognition research. So here's the structure of the study. We start off at baseline before anyone starts music. And we measure kids at baseline and then every year for five years. We measure a series of behavioral measures and brain measures, and we look for the connections. And at this point, we're about halfway through. In fact, we have about 100 kids that we have two years of measurements on. So, music is a big thing, right? We can't really just look at what is the effect of music. That makes no sense. So what we've done is focused on rhythm. And this is not an arbitrary choice. Uh, in terms of, of actual skills, it turns out that rhythm correlates with many things like language and attention. So it's a good place to start. We developed some tests of rhythm using this little guy, Bleepo, who's on a musical journey, and kids kind of follow along with him and see how well he's doing. So one test is a beat perception, our ability to perceive the beat. And I'd like us to try it out now. Okay, the question is, is Bleepo playing along on the beat? There'll be music and beeps, and you just have to listen and decide, how is he doing? You can bob your head, tap your foot if you want. Okay, great job, right? And yes, I do have to admit, we subjected these tender kids to 80s rock music. <laughs> Here's another example. <laughs> okay. Not so good. Now, an unexpected outcome came out of this. On the second year, lots of kids came back and remembered Bleepo, and he was doing just as badly in year two as he was in year one. And they said, you know, Bleepo really needs to practice harder. He didn't get any better. <laughs> Okay, here are some results. These are results from a test, actually, of tapping accuracy, tapping along with the metronome. Um, this shows, at baseline, all of the students that we have, the 100 that we have two years of data on, and it shows that, that uh, accuracy improves over time, as shown by the black line. The blue dots are control kids without music, red dots are kids who are learning music. Now, what happens in year two? Are kids going to follow that same average curve, or will there be more variation? Well, of course, growing up ain't easy, right? There's variation all over the place. Some kids get better, some kids get worse, okay? But in particular, looking at the music kids, um, we see that in many cases, 
Um, well, actually, in all cases, they're getting better. So that was really the unexpected finding. It's not that necessarily that music kids get better faster on the whole, but they just get better more consistently than the control group. And then the other thing is that we found lots of people who got a lot better than would be expected just by the normal age progression. Importantly, we also found that these music kids did better on various tests of language perception connected with this synchronization. But the real question is how does this depend on the brain? What's going on in the brain? Here's an example of another finding where we found that last test that we did, the beat perception test, turns out this area of cortex that is responsible for motor planning and motor execution predicts how well people do on the beat perception test. So even if we take out all that age variation, we still have this predictive relationship. So larger motor cortex improves beat perception, or at least it's correlated with. Um, so that's pretty neat. We've got a perceptual process that's being shaped and influenced, perhaps, by motor cortex. So it'll take us a few more years till we're really confident of these findings, until we know for sure if it's music that's enlarging the cortex, or there's maybe some kind of inbuilt variability. But assume that we get there. Let's go back to our friend Jeannie. She returns to the doctor two years later for her next brain checkup, and he finds that those areas that they had targeted with music are doing, doing fine. They're back on track. So I'd like to end there and just, uh, just kind of remind you, music is important, I think. Um, and music and kids seems like a good combination. But it's important to remember that music training isn't necessarily just for training great musicians like we've seen earlier. Um, it can also benefit kids that aren't really musical. And in particularly, maybe it'll benefit the kids that are the least musical best. So in closing, I just want you to take this away. Making music matters.